Hello and welcome to the last of the Richard Caster Talks. It's been a fantastic year celebrating and inquiring more into the life of this previous incumbent of St Stephen's Church. And I'm really delighted tonight to be joined by Madeline Knight, who is the current incumbent of St Stephen's Church. Madeline has been incumbent at St Stephen's for 11 years now, for three of which I was very pleased to be able to assist with the spirit. Um, Madeline is tonight going to be uh, exploring some of the continuities in God's mission in out of the parish of St Stephen's from the time of Richard Caster to today and the title of the talk tonight is the ministry of Richard Caster continues so I'm going to shut up and hand over to Madeline. Thank you Alex, thank you. Well, <clears throat> what a story. Some of what I will say, some of you, if you've heard other talks, it, there'll be bits of repetition. Um, but this talk also stands alone for those of you who haven't seen the other talks. So in this period of time when I've been vicar here, um, we, we've had all sorts of changes. Um, the building, and the church has been transformed beyond recognition. It, it started with the development of the Chapelfield Shopping Centre that has very recently been renamed Chantry Place. They are our near neighbour. You can see them at the back of this photograph. That uh, was, also, was followed by a near catastrophic event in which the building cracked from bottom to top due to a water leak. We reeled from this for several years. The shopping centre coming, the cracking of the chancel, and later the changes in the community, although huge challenges at the time, have been stepping stones to the church thriving today. Richard Caster, who served at St Stephen's, between 1402 and 1420, as many of you know by now, was part of a much stronger congregation than our congregation today. And others looked towards St. Stephen's and supported it. We know it was a very mixed congregation that other, including poor people who Richard left money to in his will, wealthy merchants and prominent Norwich people. Two of the congregation, John Daniel and Robert Brazier, became mayors of Norwich. Brazier also served as a member of parliament. It was certainly a church to belong to. Richard Caster's prayer, which was so popular that 20 handwritten co copies have survived, includes the phrase, give us grace. It's as if this has been answered for us. In the last couple of years, Alex and Medi Collier, church warden, have taken time with me to reflect on these recent years and have identified grace upon grace. The hope and knowledge of grace, undeserved favour, is something that unites us with Richard across the centuries. But before I talk about that, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping, declaring my own background an inevitable bias, and then provide a thumbnail sketch of church history in the 15th century and now to paint a backdrop. The stage is made of evidence of a shared Trinitarian faith expressed at St. Stephen's during the time of Richard Caster and in this present generation, as I will try and prove to you. The quiet orthodoxy that unites this church past and present is then illustrated by some stories that make the links more obvious. We face new circumstances in each generation. And the Bible 
doesn't give us a script for these particular situations. But each generation does respond to the world in which we live. We have noticed a similarity in the ways in which responses have happened at St. Stephen's, both in the 15th century and happen now in our present generation of churchgoers at St. Stephen's. We have called these grace responses. The stories of these grace responses point time and time again to the mystery of the passionate love of God for humanity, which Ri Richard pleaded with his hearers to understand and accept. So, the provisos. I'm a professional practitioner, an ordained priest in the Church of England. I'm not an academic historian or theologian and not a talented broadcaster, unlike some other speakers in this series of lectures. My church background is in, within Roman Catholicism, the denomination that Richard Case deserved. I have been strongly influenced by the worldwide um, Pentecostal movement, which impacted established churches from the 1960s. Richard's contemporary, Marjorie Caster, who Carol Hill talked about at length, the King's Lynn mystic, might have been much more comfortable in Pentecostal churches, but they didn't yet exist. My sympathies do, of course, inform the bias of my interpretation. I will be drawing on history and theology as a lay person, not as an academic. This starts with the views that I have found from both disciplines about the connection between the past and the present. On holiday, I read a book by Sebastian Fawkes, Paris Echo, written in 2018. He writes about a history professor and she is said to recommend to her students that they attend a lecture in quantum physics in order to get a first idea of the flexible nature of time. The students were asked to understand that history is neither past nor other, but an extension of the present to which all people, whether they know it or not, are attached. She quotes the poet T.S. Eliot, who in the Four Quartets writes, history is now and England. The Christian writer, Alastair Petrie, in his book, Releasing Heaven on Earth, says, similar to our genetic inheritance, heredity includes the passing on of social, mental, emotional, and spiritual attitudes that can be observed from one generation to another. There can be good heredity and distorted heredity, forgetting what is both good and bad based on the content and quality of our four parents' stewardship. This encourages us to look for connection between Richard Caster and St. Stephen's now, even when the historical contexts are so different and are 600 years apart. So those are the provisos and rationale for making this connection. Now I want to talk about the backdrop of these stories. 
I have a map here that shows in various colours the spread of Christianity starting in Jerusalem. You can see that it, Christianity spread around the Mediterranean, around the edge of the Mediterranean. There is then a pivotal point when the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and in, in the fourth century. And from then on, the state and the church became intertwined. You can see this in the large pink area, which shows the um, very sudden spread of Christianity in the fourth century. There was in the 11th century, so that's 700 years later, a huge split between East and West. And in fact, this followed a national split that had followed, that had already um, occurred between the Byzantine and the Roman empires. You can see it clearly marked as a red line. Our concerns are solely with the West. And that's then shown very clearly in the next slide. The Western Roman Catholic Church had by the 15th century all become extremely powerful, wealthy and political. The church had the monopoly on education and Richard Caister, like all priests, could read and write in Latin, study scripture and interpret it for his followers. But there was a fear within the institution as Alex explained in his lecture, that allowing ordinary, unchurched people to read scripture would lead to the institutional church losing power and influence. I want to say, of course, they were right, but it was no reason not to let it happen. Archbishop Arundel successfully crushed movements that threatened the status quo in the church. These included Bible translation into English and all treaties on theological matters outside those made by the church hierarchy. So although Richard sat at a point in history in which the church was about to explode into hundreds of fragments, at the moment he was priest at St. Stephen's, there was still a unity and that unity flowed into the understanding of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. This single church, the Roman Catholic Church at this time, stretched from Scandinavia to North Africa and as far east as the borders with Russia and Greece. The Trinitarian nature of God is the bedrock of these stories and has been understood in many different ways through the history of the church. Of course, it is present in the text of the Bible and the fourth century creeds that were finalized after long debate are still held uh, by the, the Christian church. But the relative importance of Father, Son and Holy Spirit have been highlighted in different ways at different times since then. Holding of a balanced Trinitarian theology by Richard Caister is illustrated in the wonderful pilgrim badges I've, I've chosen two. In this one, um, the, the, the top, the face of God, which, which is inclined to get broken off, um, as you'll see in, in the second slide, it is very, very clear. The hands of God, the face of God, of, of Father God. And then you might notice the dove representing the spirit whispering into Richard's ear. 
Richard is always depicted in a pulpit expounding the word of God. To God alone, honour and glory. So within these badges, and here's a second one, and you will have seen more if you've been to the exhibition at St Stephen's. We see Richard surrounded by the image the images representing the three parts of the Godhead, Father, Holy Spirit, and Son, the Word. So Richard lived before this great upheaval in the church that was just round the corner. And the next slide shows us how the church split. You might be most interested in Great Britain, which now instead of being a single color is uh, three at the very least um, with the Church of England, the Calvinists and the Roman Catholics all taking sections. The Reformation, which was the point at which this splintering happened, changes church governance, theologies and practices, and I would suggest was necessary to address the corruption that had marked this long, slow deterioration of the church. These days, um, we have now got to a point where the deterioration of the power of the church is such that many people are ignorant of its beliefs and suspicious of its adherence. In the 16th century, the point of this splintering, the German monk Luther challenged the corruption and distorted understanding of God in the Roman Catholic Church. He was disillusioned by what he saw in Rome, the centre of the institution, when he emerged from his monastery. As he climbed the stairs of St John Lateran Basilica, saying the Lord's Prayer on every step as an act of piety and supplication, the words from scripture from Romans rattled through his head, the righteous shall live by faith. He knew scripture well, and he understood that Jesus as man and God had in his death paid the spiritual penalty for wrongdoing. For Luther, the buying of spiritual favours was suddenly totally unacceptable, and he called out the corruption of the institution. Luther turned the spotlight on Jesus his significance and desire to come close to anyone who called out to him. Luther will have known the verse uh, which um, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved that you can find in Old and New Testaments. So although, of course, the church had always revolved around the life and death of Jesus Christ. Medieval theology had lim limited the presence of Jesus to the bread of the mass, the prayers and the meditations of the priests. And there was a reoccurring motif of the passion of Jesus, which uh, turns up time and time again. Jesus was very present, but Luther turns a spotlight on him and, and highlights his significance in a way that hadn't been highlighted before. Much more recently, in the early 20th century, there was an explosion of Holy Spirit activity as people started to experience and demonstrate gifts described, described at the beginning of the church, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy and the words of knowledge. This led to yet more different churches I don't have a map for them. There are thousands, this time not limiting their teaching to the life, death and power to liberate of Jesus, but on the possibility of being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
thus experiencing the spirit of God for yourself. St. Stephen's today includes people who believe in Jesus Christ as man and God, who through his death, life and death, re-establish the connection between humanity and God. They believe in Father God, the creator, with different views of how the creation might have happened, but still they believe in him as creator. And many have experienced the Holy Spirit and expect the Spirit to be active, informing decisions, giving dreams, visions and nudges as we work out our life together. So having thought about Richard before the Reformation and his balance of Trinitarian theology and thought about ourselves a long post-Reformation with also a, a bringing together of Father, Son and Holy Spirit in a more balanced way than we have seen in our recent past. It seems to me that here maybe is one of our first connections with Richard Caster. We do not emphasize any one member of the Trinity, Father, Son or Holy Spirit, but have a high view of each. Of course, this isn't uncommon in, in churches today. The pilgrim badges demonstrate the balance of Trinitarian faith. It seems, looking back on church history, as if the Reformation was a necessary re-envisioning of faith, starting with Jesus and being followed by a re-envisioning of the Holy Spirit, both driven by people committed to prayer learning and truth in order to challenge the bankruptcy of the institution that at the time um, had had taken hold i suggest that there's now a more settled acceptance of the nature and operation of the trinity in many churches in a way that makes the prayer of richard the talk of healing at his tomb and Marjorie Kemp's revelations seem positively familiar. So there's the backdrop, the history, and the, the stage, the um, joint understanding of, of the Trinity. And now, time to think about this word, grace that I mentioned right at the beginning, that Richard prays for, and we see as having um, benefited from, while also knowing that we too need to be gracious in our response to God. Understanding of grace that flows from God is this uniting feature with Richard. Some theologians talk about improvisation rooted in the knowledge of God leading to reactions within our communities that neither block nor accept unconditionally but find a middle path. By reflecting on what has happened over the last few years at St. Stephen's, we have identified, identified eight areas in which we have responded in a way that has led to the untold goodness of God, not linked sufficiently with our responses, but a, of a giving beyond our wildest dreams. This phrase, grace responses, is a pattern of behaviour that seem to um, trigger um, a response in God. They are given to us by God, but we have a choice as to whether to use them or not. We, Alex and Biddy and I, um, identified 
eight at work in St. Stephen's in recent, recent years. I, I'm sure there, there are multitudes of them um, and different people identify different ones at different times um, according to their circumstances. They're not complicated and look simple, but can be harder to do than say. This may sound a bit confused at the moment, but once I give you some examples, I hope it will be clearer. In the new um, international version of Matthew's gospel, there's a very famous verse, which is take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls a verse that is very important to many people. A, a different translation called the, the Message puts it like this. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Writing about the events at St. Stephen's in recent years, these grace responses or unforced rhythms of grace seem to have swished backwards and forwards like waves between our community and the Holy Spirit. From this rhythm has flowed goodness, not just for us, but for many people who might never know the source. It's very difficult to think that our response matters much to a God who is complete and doesn't need us. However, the wonder is that although this is true, our responses to life really do matter, they are really important. The three grace responses that I've chosen and have put stories with, I have named as holding difference, practicing practical compassion, and choosing with freedom. They're all things that we've identified in our own recent history and also in the life of Richard Caster. Holding difference, practicing practical compassion and choosing with freedom. The first example, the holding difference, comes from Richard's response to Marjorie Kemp. Carol Hill actually used the same example that I'm going to use. And I'm sorry if you're bored with hearing this again, but it is a quite a remarkable event that was recorded by Marjorie um, as she dictated um, her experiences and remarkably, um, they were written down. Here we have um, a, a picture of, of Marjorie as depicted um, a, by a carver uh, in, um, this is a pew end in St. Margaret's Kings Lynn, the church where Marjorie um, attended. Um, if, if, you've, if you've read her, her book, you, you just know that she was, she was a really unusual. And um, Carol commented that um, male academics are, are rude about her now. And I would say to you, I, I have met some male clergy that are quite rude about her too. But that aside, there is something about her that is, I guess she's, she's one of these Marmite people who, who's inclined to put people's backs up. Um, and, and now I'll just show you um, a small snippet of her book, this, this extraordinary um, book that she ha had written down 
um, she organized it, it's writing down. And within it, um, she she tells of, of her life. It, it's thought to be the first autobiography ever in, in this country. So Richard and Marjorie met. Um, they met after Marjorie's last child was born. She had 14 children. And she and her husband had decided had agreed on mutual celibacy. And she immediately embarked on an eventful life of pilgrimage in England, Europe and the Holy Land, visiting great and humble religious figures of her day. The first place she went was to see Richard Caster at St. Stephen's. And this is what happened as in her words. She refers to herself as this creature. One day, while this creature was bearing children and was newly delivered of a child, our Lord Christ Jesus said to her that she should not bear more children and therefore he commanded her to go to Norwich. And she said, ah, dear Lord, how shall I go? I am feeling faint and weak. Don't be afraid. I shall make you strong enough. I bid you go to the Vicar of St. Stephen's and say that I greet him warmly and that he is a high chosen soul of mine and tell him he greatly pleases me with his preaching and tell him the secrets of your soul and my count counsels that I reveal to you. We imagine this happening in, in the porch at St. Stephen's, uh, which is possibly the only part of the building that was uh, as it is today when, when they met. She greeted the vicar asking him if she could in the afternoon when he had eaten speak to him for an hour or two of the love of God. He, lifting up his hands and blessing himself, said, bless us, how could a woman occupy one or two hours with the love of our Lord? I shan't eat a thing till I find out what you can say of our Lord in the space of an hour. So they sat down in the church. What follows in the book are details of what they talked about. You will not be surprised if you read her book that people thought her strange, tormented, sick in body and soul and spirit. However, whatever she told him, he was convinced by her. Later, she dictates, notwithstanding the protests and resentments of people against her, Richard demonstrated his acceptance of her by supporting her when she was called to appear before the harsh Bishop of Norwich, Bishop Dispenser, to face serious charges of Lolladi. She writes, this holy vicar after this time was always confessor to this creature when she came to Norwich and gave her communion with his own hands. And when on one she was admonished to appear before certain officers of the bishop to ask, answer certain charges that would be made against her through the agitation of envious people, the good vicar, preferring the love of God above any shame of the world, went with her to hear her examination, together and delivered her from the malice of her enemies. This is what I call holding difference. He didn't try and persuade her to be something else that she wasn't. And my guess is that he was quite challenged by her behavior. It is a building of relationship of people who might not in the normal course of life have anything in common and might not have anything to do with each other. 
As we see here in the story of Marjorie and Richard, the initial prejudices are not justified, but they were there. And this is only discovered by making time to get to know the person for themselves, not just their appearance or manner. In recent years, holding difference has been key to St. Stephen's in a completely different way. It started with the church talking with the contractors who started the building work um, as the chocolate factory was taken down and the new shopping centre put up. This may sound obvious to you, but the first letter of approach by the contractors to St. Stephen's was put in a drawer, its significance not recognised. Here are some, a couple, uh, some pictures to just demonstrate to you the extraordinary change that has happened um, in the surrounding area. On the left, you can see an old car park and an old office building, huge trees. Um, if, if you're very observant, you will also know that the contractors changed the um, tombstones around. But um, that, was, that was new to me when I found these pictures. But the transformation is enormous. And in a second picture, in a second slide, you will see another two pictures, this time looking in the other direction. Uh, there was no path. The trees were enormous. It's easier in this one to see the difference between the before and after because you can see the buildings in the distance the same. This church with its small congregation entered into conversation with um, high level business people for, for the sake of um, allowing people to work walk through the church, which as you'll see later, was they didn't have to, it, it was a conversation. But actually much more recently and in, in a much more personal way, much more like um, Richard and Marjorie, the relaunching of the cafe that had started many years before as a collaboration between Age Concern and the church, with a new policy of eat, drink and share, pay what is fair, brought many people into the church who are just a huge variety of people with a huge variety of backgrounds, interests, life situations and behaviours. In 2014, when the new cafe was launched, there were many rough sleepers in the city and many people who would never feel comfortable in a branded coffee outlet, but would come into St. Stephen's. We attracted people with unconventional behaviour because there was space and they were accepted. Initially, off, just like Richard, we had our prejudices, but we learned that by listening to people and respecting them, we could de-escalate behavior that was disturbing to other cafe users. It has been a very long, slow learning curve, but we have had some wonderful unexpected interactions during the years. There's one that comes to mind of an older lady who befriended a young man who regularly used legal highs and was often disturbed and disorientated. He both were comfortable in the cafe and as time went on, she befriended him. And when he was really disturbed, the cafe staff would invite him to sit down with her and she would listen to him and talk to him and he would li leave calmer. They would never have met otherwise. And this lady had a rare gift, which she was able to use. She was just very ordinary. She came in on the bus and went back on the bus. But she was able to give him a sense of belonging that other people couldn't do. The welcome to many different people 
good, healthy, reasonably priced food and a large, warm, clean space has led to a thriving cafe that is known for helping the disadvantaged and frequented by many people who like the peaceful atmosphere, which despite all the differences does persist. This grace response of holding difference is not static. Just as Richard didn't expect to support Marjorie Kemp when facing the Bishop of Norwich, neither did we expect to have to amend our generosity. In 2016, the number of rough sleepers increased significantly throughout England. Norwich had many more than before, and everyone by now knew about St Stephen's Cafe. We had someone working to support individuals paid for by the surpluses at that time of, from the cafe. We were giving so much food away and it was being funded by, the, by people who used the cafe. So some people came and paid more and other people came and had food uh, subsidized. But what was happening was we were beginning to be taken for a ride by a by groups of drinkers who could buy their beers, but not the cost of a toasted sandwich. So we stopped holding different people together because the homeless had taken over. We were able to restore the balance by praying together, by talking together. Uh, we decided to ask everybody for a pound, um, if, if they were going to have food. And this just restored the balance. Again, we are now holding different people together within the cafe. The way in which we've held the difference in this community is very, very different from the way in which Richard related to Marjorie because our circumstances are so different, but the principles are similar pushing through prejudice, constantly working at relationships with people who are very different from ourselves. And now we provide an environment where lots of different people can interact with each other. For us to hold difference flowed out of our offering practical compassion. Practical compassion is the next grace response that I want to talk about. This came first in the subsidised food and treating everyone the same, queuing up, putting in an order and having food delivered to the table, whether you had paid for it or paid a pound or paid more. As relationships built with people who were experiencing various forms of disadvantage, we began to learn that many were not access accessing the help that was available in the city because they were fearful of officials or their mental health was persuading them that there was a conspiracy against them or they couldn't read or they couldn't fill out forms or more. So our administrator who routinely helped diffuse situations in the cafe started to help sort their affairs as they asked, pointing them to the agencies available to provide for them. She was a friend with their interests at heart. In time, some people helped by the community worker volunteered in the cafe. And as the holding difference and the practical compassion dynamic lines became blurred, the helpers, um, the helped became helpers and were absorbed into our community. Richard Caster's will, so here's a document showing his, the document of his will and a translation demonstrates his care for the poor. It was his ultimate act of practical compassion and we can only guess from it of the many acts of practical compassion that happened during his life. His will demonstrates his response to the prevailing religious norms as well. As in many other things, he had an understanding of his ability to choose freely. So we've had a long time looking at the grace response of holding difference. And I have incorporated within that and now and just summarized um, 
the practical compassion towards those in disadvantage. And this now then fuses into this grace response of knowing that you have freedom to choose. His will demonstrates that he had freedom to choose to do things differently from the norm of the time. At, at the time, it would be very unusual to give all your money to the poor. You would be much more likely in your concern about your salvation to pay for people to pray for you. In fact, it's interesting that Chapelfield has just changed its name to Chantry Place. Chantry is a way, is, is, is a shorthand for the way in which people routinely had prayers said for them after they died. But Richard was thinking separately. He knew he was free not to be cowed by the religious climate or the norms. In, this, in his time, this was courageous. But he didn't only do this in the writing of his will, which of course he didn't pay any penalty for because he was dead by the time it came into action. He had lived like this long before he thought of writing his will. He lived being an independent thinker and knowing that he was free to make his own decisions relative to the religious environment in which he worked by preaching in English and writing his prayer in English for the people to use without any priestly intermediary. If you want to know more about this, then do listen to Alex's talk. The way in which St. Stephen's has followed his lead is in choosing with freedom to, to develop the church space as both for worship and hospitality. This, like Richard's prayer and will, may seem unremarkable, but in the context they, of, of their time, they, they are very unusual and not what you might expect. So let's talk about the church as cafe and worship place. In current Western culture, there is anxiety and uncertainty and ignorance about the unseen. It can be traced back to the 18th century philosophical school of thought, the Enlightenment. This movement favoured rational, sceptical and empirical thinking, which assumed that well-researched physical evidence would point to a world without God. It created a distrust of intuition, revelation and the spiritual. All faith was suspicious and the Bible was suspected as not containing testable truth. This shift in philosophical thought led to the energetic pursuit of concrete evidence and coincided with an expansion of scientific knowledge, which was great, but it's not the whole story. The Enlightenment framework of philosophical thought can be traced back to the ingenious philosopher and mathematician René Descartes. He was born at the beginning of the 1600s in the post-Reformation environment in its radical changes of church structures. Whole nations, as we saw in the earlier slide, were taking on different expressions of Christian faith. Descartes put forward the idea of a separation of mind and body, which formulated the first modern version of mind, body, dualism. He wrote much. He is less well known for his two proofs of the existence of God based on rational thinking and his trust of sensory experience. In the 19th century, Nietzsche, commenting on the Enlightenment, used the phrase God is dead in a figurative way, but this was then used by what became known the death of God theologians 
as a strapline for their views. Even if the full work of these philosophers was not properly understood, their words were used to champion different ways of viewing the world. This led to an understanding that the secular and spiritual are totally separate and undermined faith in the power of Jesus to change lives. It gave people justification for abandoning faith and developing purely secular views of the world. As these theories influenced Christian theologians, they started to apply deductive reason to the Bible. The theory that Jesus was a myth and never existed was voiced most clearly by the theologian Rudolf Boltmann. Um, he tried to demythologize demytholo the teaching of Jesus by stripping away the miraculous. The philosophical view that thought is sufficient for good moral living and happiness was challenged in the 20th century by the carnage and atrocities of World War I, the Great War. Deconstructed Christian faith had little to offer to counter this disillusionment. It seems as if the understanding of the goodness and the reality of the living God was getting lost. The separation of sacred and secular, which had previously been unthinkable. Richard's world, it would have been unthinkable to separate what he did in church from what he did for, for the poor in his village. Or, I mean, in, in the city, in his, in his region of the city. It would have been unthinkable. The church cared for the sick, the church educated the young and had sole responsibility for caring for the poor as well as um, providing worship day in and day out within the churches and institutions within the country. At the Great Hospital in Norwich, founded in 1249 for the for the care of decrepit priests, that is priests who in old age had no one to care for them. The wards looked towards the wards, the ward in which they slept, had their bed, ate, were cared for and nursed, pointed towards the altar in which the mass was said without hindrance. The space for the care for the sick was continuous with the space where worship happened. In the 16th century, when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, the running of the great hospital passed from the church to the city fathers. The separation of uh, state and church was beginning. Huge, enormous walls went up, separating the wards so where people were cared for from the central chapel. It's still like that today. St. Stephen's Cafe and church in the same space challenges this dualism, which is why sometimes people just think it's downright wrong because we're just so unused to it. In medieval times, it would be downright right. Our church space flip-flops between the cafe during the week and the church worship on Sunday and worship happening in different parts of the church during the week. And it all happens with the movement of some very light chairs. This can be offensive to some who accuse us of trading in the temple but we are very careful that we sell food for the body and occasionally food for the soul, books and nothing else. And we do so compassionately and not um, in a way that uh, takes advantage. So here, so the, I'm coming to an end, all the stories are coming to an end. So here are my thoughts 
on the connection between Richard Caister and our present church community. What an extraordinary heritage to have the faithfulness, faithfulness, honesty and piety of this extraordinary priest in our history. There is much more to say about the generations between him and us. And we can remarkably find examples of holding difference, practicing practical compassion and choosing with freedom within those generations too. But that's not for today. If you are interested, do of course come and visit us, come and see the, the church in, in operation. And if you want to know much more about Richard Caster, um, the good vicar, do, do come into the office. We're, we're not allowed to put them out at the moment, but if you come and ask at the office, we have lots of Frank Mears exceptionally exceptional um, account of Richard Caster, which puts together all the historical evidence that we have at the moment. We think that more will be uncovered in time as more wills of that period are translated. But it is the most comprehensive. Um, there is a translation of Richard's prayer, um, if you're interested in that, and also um, that there is um, a medieval pilgrimage. Um, I don't have a picture of that for you, but if you're interested in visiting some of the places mentioned in these lectures, um, a, a, a delightful little booklet has been put together and you can actually follow them around uh, in Norwich and see where they are and how they, what they look like today. I want to say amen. That must mean I'm preaching. <laughs> That's it, Alex. Madeline, thank you so much. Um, do you have time for one or two questions? Uh, they have to be quick. They have to be, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Um, 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 I, um, it's been so encouraging to hear about the continuity of God's work in between the 600 years from Richard Caster through to what's going on at St. Stephen's today. Um, I was really struck by what you said about these ways of being that chime in with the heart and ways of God and open up, open up new possibilities, new blessings. There's so much in that that is so exciting in that our response and our action can create new possibilities and a new future. Hmm. But the things that you described are hard, um, holding difference, practical compassion, freedom to choose. Um, so the one question, I've got one question. Yes. Um, how have you led, a, how has it been for you and how, what lessons could you distill in, in how you've led a church through these hard grace responses? Well, maybe not one lesson, but what, do you have a reflection yeah. on that? Um, I I think, and and that that this is not in this talk. I think it's because I've experienced them all myself um, in my life long before I was ordained. And so I knew the power of them. And I knew the power of what looks like small and simple, but actually is really profound. And, um, and so, and that probably reflects the way in which we have responded positively at St. Stephen's. There may be others that we might have there may have been other ways that we might have responded positively, but I didn't, I didn't see them because they weren't, I didn't have eyes to see them. And, and I think, I think leading churches, we are, it's as if 
we can lead in the ways in which we have seen God at work in our own lives. Yeah. And then it, then it, and it can be really ordinary, but, uh, but then, then it's, and, and some people learn those. It's not only in the past. I mean, there's, there's a book about um, a rhythm of prayer that transformed a, a retreat center that was learnt and, and, and it was just an ordinary thing that then seemed to have a huge, profound impact. Hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you very much. And um, thank, thank you also for, for people who have tuned into these videos over the last six or seven months or so, or been into St. Stephen's to see the, see the exhibition and pick up some of those booklets that Madeline was talking about. This is the last of the um, scheduled Richard Casey talks. Um, and it has been a real pleasure to have put this whole thing together. Um, and it's, um, yes, so thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>